I've never seen a yacht like this in my dreams Sailing the seas in boats so grand, it seems But we're just humble sailors Salt upon our cheeks Go classic every day of the week Hey everybody, welcome back to Boat Fool Sailing. So today, Canadian Ken and I are out kicking the jack stands because this time of year is the time of year that you're going to go look at boats to buy, right? And we're going to give you this Boat Fool's five-minute DIY sailboat survey so you can quickly discern whether or not a boat belongs on your short list of boats you're actually going to pay for a full survey on. Now, what we're going to show you is not exhaustive, but we're going to show you different things to look for that you should be able to blow through in five minutes to quickly tell if the boat is worthy of your list. All right, let's go check them out. So if you live in an area where sailing is seasonal like Maine, oftentimes boats are wrapped for the winter and you can't see their top sides. So we're going to show you what to look for on boats when you can't see the top sides and you'll be able to tell if the boat's worthy of your shortlist or not. So here we are on a small uh, Sabre. And this, if you were looking at this boat, I think it's a Sabre 28. This would be considered to be in good shape. Not too much bottom paint on her. Uh, you got a um, partial uh, skeg hung rudder here. So the rudder's a little bit protected. You got a little uh, thing here to keep lines uh, from going into um, your rudder there and fouling it up. Your offset prop, you've got a zinc on here, a sacrificial zinc. And so it's clear that uh, this boat has been uh, used the way it's intended to be used and well maintained. And then down here, uh, your keel looks to be in good shape. You do see a little bit of separation, a little bit of a hairline crack there. That's typical when you have dissimilar um, materials uh, here to each other. So uh, I would say this boat has not been in a grounding or anything like that. It's not uncommon on an older boat to see that. And we'll show you some examples of ones that have been in groundings. Um, but not too much bottom paint, no blistering. This is ACES. So you're looking for blisters. And blisters basically are uh, free um, water soluble chemicals within the fiberglass that through osmosis attract water through the gel coat and adhere to those uh, water soluble chemicals and then those water molecules can't get back out and it forms a blister. If you see a couple of those, that's okay. You see a lot that look like chicken pox, walk away. All right, so this is an example of a full keel boat and this boat is about 30 feet. And what's nice about a full keel boat is uh, you've got the nice uh, keel hung rudder and your prop is protected. So up in Maine, uh, it's harder to foul on a lobster pot and a uh, nice little two bladed bronze prop and this is nicely protected. Uh, this boat has several layers of bottom paint on it, so it's getting to the point where you might want to sand this down and put some new barrier coats on there and, re and start from scratch. But I would not walk away from this boat. This boat looks like it's been well maintained, and uh, despite the layers of paint, everything else looks to be great. Uh, nice full keel, uh, nice, this is gonna be a nice steady boat at sea. All right, so this is a nice spade rudder, and what caught our eye about this and would be concerning if you were looking to buy this boat is uh, you see some rust coming through here. And that means the framing in here uh, is probably rusting. There's water intrusion, which is not uncommon in rudders, but you're going to want to find out if this is going to be a big fix or not or if it's something to worry about. Um, and you'll see some more spots on this side uh, where it's sort of weeping through. And that would be concerning to me if I were looking at this boat. So this might be one you would walk away from if you had a better alternative. Although it's just the rudder, at least. It's, it's just not, the yeah. rudder, right. Uh, and that can be fixed. You can get new rudders made. It's a process and can be expensive. Um, but otherwise, uh, despite that, the, the rest of this looks good. Again, you can see a slight seam here. And this is because of the uh, dissimilar material. But th this bottom could use a fresh coat of paint, but it doesn't need to be sanded. Uh, but it's otherwise, it's nice, nice fin keel. This is going to be a fast uh, racer cruiser. I'd keep it on the list, but I'd look into that rudder. Yeah. If this boat were on my list, I would walk away. This is a iron keel that is uh, weeping a lot of rust and is just going to be an ongoing problem. Uh, it's pitted. It's rusting, and I would probably walk away. What do you got here? This is a nice folding prop. Um, so if you're adamant about getting the last little ounces of speed out of your boat, you'll want one of these. It can make a big difference in maybe up to half a knot of uh, boat speed versus you know, a non-folding prop. But uh, yeah, 
Nice little boat. Yeah. It's fun looking at boats. Another thing you want to check for quickly is your uh, cutlass bearing and uh, to make sure there's not too much play in your prop shaft and to make sure that your um, prop shaft turns. Uh, if it's really stiff, that could be a problem, but you also want to make sure it's not loose in here. Your cutlass bearing is a, uh, uh, a bearing inside your strut here. And if that wears down too much, you get too much prop shaft shake and it's going to vibrate and cause problems. So uh, this seems to be in good shape, but it's probably the only thing that's in good shape on this boat. Uh, <laughs> this would be a walk away, but that's a nice example of a um, prop shaft strut there. So this is a Catalina, and this is a classic example of the Catalina smile where uh, the keel is meet, meeting the hull here. And that can be a problem if not addressed, but keep an eye out for that on any Catalina that you look at. All right, so here you are, you're coming to look at a boat that's for sale, and this happens to be our boat so we can go up on deck, but she's covered up so you can't see the top size. But uh, what's interesting about this boat is it's got a fully encapsulated keel as opposed to a fin keel that's bolted on. This is actually uh, the fiberglass and the lead is poured into the cavity and it's integral to the boat. So uh, it's not gonna fall off, there are no keel bolts. You don't have to worry about it. So for us, when uh, the three of us boat fools were looking at a boat to buy, this is one of the things that attracted us to this boat was the encapsulated keel. So uh, the pros and cons to everything, for us, this was a pro. Um, all right, so what's interesting about this boat too is another thing that we liked about it was the protected prop because we're up in Maine, um, a lot of lobster pots, this is gonna be harder to foul and we really like this. But uh, again, when you're looking at a used boat, um, you wanna make sure you can turn the prop and you want to make sure there's no play in it. Your cutlass bearing in this boat is in here so it's going to be harder to get out and that can be a costly and time consuming process. So um, Ken, pop quiz, what's missing off this prop shaft right here? The, um, the, the, the sacrificial zinc. Bingo, we got a winner. Nice job Kenneth. Uh, yeah, so let's uh, Let's go up on deck and we're going to show you some things about this boat which is not perfect by any means. We're going to show you some imperfections and things to look out for. So uh, when you're looking at a boat, uh, whether it's covered with a, a canvas tarp like this or plastic, there's usually a port to get in. So we just came up a ladder and we're going to pretend this is the boat we're looking at. Now, this is our boat. It's in disarray right now because we're doing a lot of work on it, but we're going to show you the pictures of her as we found her and why uh, she was uh, determined to be a nice clean boat and why we kept looking at her and decided to get a survey on it. But uh, what we're going to show you now is a couple of simple things to look for uh, for uh, things to avoid and the things to look for uh, in the plus column. So uh, the first one is we're going to do uh, a tap test. Now it might be a little awkward if the owner's around, so if you're by yourself it's a little easier, uh, but you don't necessarily need uh, a very expensive moisture meter. We're going to show you how to do it with just a simple screwdriver. A bigger one's a little bit better, something with a little heft, but uh, you want to just tap in certain places and you're going to hear, um, you're going to hear a nice solid sounding reverb on that. Now we know we have some moisture in this boat and when you tap on it, this is, this is good fiberglass, not good fiberglass. All right, so now we're over on the starboard side. I'm gonna tap exactly opposite of the known problem spot on the port side. Nice, nice sharp response there with the screwdriver. So just to verify my findings, I'm gonna put the moisture meter there. And as you can see, I'm in the green and everything is okay for the moment. Now we're gonna go back over to uh, port side, to the known area and double check. It's a dull sound, more of a thud. Putting the moisture meter on there again, We'll verify our worst fears that we've got elevated moisture in this one particular section of the deck. Now, moisture is not always uh, a reason to walk away from a boat, but it's worth checking uh, and random checking along uh, the side decks, near chain plates, stanchions, uh, where your mast goes through uh, the deck, if it's uh, keel stepped and or if it's uh, deck stepped. Uh, it doesn't, like I said, doesn't necessarily mean you need to walk away. You just need to check. This particular spot we knew about from our survey and we determined that it was in an area where uh, there was no high stress on the boat and we could address the issue when we had time. It was graded 
a uh, low level um, urgency situation by the surveyor. But we know it's there and we know how to fix it. All right, so when you first go below on a boat that's been stored for the winter and it's undercover, take a big whiff because your senses, your smelling senses are gonna tell you a lot. If it smells like a urinal or an outhouse, uh, you might have a black water tank leak. If something may have spilled into the bilge, if it smells like fuel, diesel, gas, or oil, uh, something's going on, like again, maybe something spilled in your bilge, maybe there's a leak somewhere, use your senses and smell because that can tell you a lot. Our boat smells like flowers. It's wonderful. Uh, other boats I've been on, you wanna get out of there as soon as possible and you're gonna get seasick down below if it smells bad. And some odors are really hard to get rid of. So pay attention. If it smells funky, it is funky. All right, so we're now down below and we're not gonna show you the rest of the boat right now because it's an absolute disaster. But what we're really concerned about here is the engine access. Now, it's easy to think, well, you know, not a big deal, but uh, if it's too crowded in there or whatever, but really you do want good access because if you're a low budget sailor like us uh, and secondhand sailors, you're not going to be paying to have your oil changed. You're going to learn how to do that yourself if you don't already know how. So you want to have access to these things. Now, uh, this access we're going to rate as average to above average. And we're going to show you why. So the first thing you want to look for is how to get engine access. So for this one, it's pretty easy. You just pull those latches and you slide the companion way out of the way and... Uh, you try not to have it fall over on you because that's going to hurt. Um, but here is the engine. Now, we, the batteries are hooked up on this boat. If they're not on the boat you're looking at, you're going to want to bring a flashlight. But here are the salient things you want to look for. And this is key because if you're going to do the work yourself, you want to have easy access to the following things. This is your raw water strainer. This is where your water comes in from the ocean, comes through the strainer, uh, and then comes up into your raw water pump. And... This pump pushes the water back through your heat exchanger to keep your engine cool and from overheating and exploding. So you want to make sure you have access to your raw water strainer because you need to check that because seaweed can get in and clog the filter and clog the water flow. The raw water uh, pump, there's an impeller in here that you need to change every so often, maybe once a season. Um, and you take this cap off and there's a, a rubber uh, wheel in there and you do need to exchange that out every now and then. Uh, so you want to have access to that. This is your coolant. You want to have access to your coolant. Uh, this is where your oil fill is. So you want to have access to that. And this is your oil dipstick, which is key. You need to be able to check your oil every time you come out on your boat. So the other thing you need to know uh, where it is, is your uh, fuel filters. On this boat, um, they happen to be in a cabinet under the sink. And we have dual Raycor uh, fuel filters, a primary and a backup in case this one gets clogged, we can switch over. So you want to have easy access to this. Typically on smaller boats, these are in the engine compartment with the engine. Uh, the previous owner modified this uh, to this setup, which is absolutely fantastic. So we have easy access to this. So this is key. And like I said, typically they would be mounted in here somewhere and you're going to want to have access to that. Uh, so again, raw water uh, strainer, your pump and your coolant and your oil and here of course is your alternator and the alternator uh, belt and you need to make sure uh, you have access to those easily and I would rate this as a BB plus in terms of access right there's also access on this each side as well yeah and we're yeah. gonna we're gonna show you that we'll so, try to show you that one as yeah. well so this is always fun so Ow. See? It's fun. <laughs> it's like, you gotta, I gotta do some more yoga. See? All right. Hey, Kenneth, can you see me? I'm in the other access port to our engine, so I'm gonna show you where your secondary fuel filter is and your oil filter. All right, so on this engine, our secondary fuel filter is right here. This one's uh, a little bit harder to access, but there's a side uh, port which we'll show you from afar so you get a sense of the layout. Here's your oil filter, that's easy to access. And another key thing is your transmission. Uh, our dipstick is right here, and then this is your, um, your drive shaft and our dripless uh, shaft seal, which you need to have access to. So these are key components that you wanna have Generally speaking, easy access to, so you don't have to climb around and contort yourself into a million different shapes to get access to it. So um, this is our engine, and this is the side port looking from afar. So this, just, this panel just comes down, and bingo. And there's a light in there, which is really nice. So again, we give this a BB+. 
When you first open up the engine compartment, look at the cleanliness of not only the engine itself, but the compartment. This one is particularly clean. Uh, the previous owner did a nice job with it, but they can be a mess. And if you see engines that look like these that we're putting up on your screen, walk away. So another thing to have on your boat is a label maker. And if the previous owner or the seller of the boat hasn't labeled things, then you ought to. So we bought a label maker. So we have one here for the, uh, the raw water seacock right here, uh, which we can access from here. And here's an example of what the previous owner did. He labeled all these wires so we know what things are. That is really key. So a key thing to look for on sailboats in particular of their sole floors is staining. And we're gonna show you some examples of, of other boats that have water damage to the sole floor. Now this sole floor has some damage, but it really just needs to be refinished. Um, that's not water damage, that's just worn over years. So we'll be able to sand that and refinish it and it's gonna look beautiful. But we're gonna show you some examples here of some stained floors where uh, obviously there's water damage and you're gonna to wanna to avoid this because uh, something happened where a lot of water got on the boat to cause that kind of damage. So you're gonna to wanna to ask about it uh, and find out if it's been cured. Uh, but if you're not into that dark look in your floor, you're gonna to wanna to walk away from a boat that's got a lot of staining on the sole floor. All right, so a real easy and fun check to do when you're on a boat that has bulkheads and uh, doors that close off your head or the V-berth is to check the fit and finish of these doors and the latches to make sure they open and close as they should, right? So uh, if you're on a boat, go up to the head and make sure the door closes and latches as it should. Because even though it seems like a minor thing, uh, if you have a person on board who's a little more modest and would like to close the head door when they use it, it's gonna become a problem. You don't want the door just swinging around either while you're at sea, right? So you wanna be able to secure it by latching it. Really simple. So if you go onto a boat and you go to close the door and it doesn't fit in the um, frame properly and it doesn't latch and close, it could be a sign of uh, the boat's been racked at some point in some way, twisted a little bit, or the bulkheads aren't tabbed properly, or it's just poor craftsmanship. And at that point, you might consider finding out if there's a reason why, or you might just want to walk away. All right, so as we said, our boat is not perfect, and you're always going to be fighting water. And this boat at one point had some water come through uh, one of the ports, and whether uh, it was an active leak for a while or wh whether or not it was left open in a storm, it damaged the wood veneer here. And we had another one like this, and we're going to show you uh, what that leads to, which is a full replacement. So. Uh, this was damaged here, so we had to replace the port because the port was shot. And now we have to um, put a new piece of veneer in here and put a new port in. But uh, not a huge deal, but if uh, you're not looking for that kind of extra work, then look for a boat that doesn't have a lot of staining around the ports. So we're going to show you some examples uh, of a boat that did have a lot of damage around ports and a boat that we actually walked away from um, when we were looking at boats. There you go. All right. So... Now we're gonna look into the bilge quickly to see what it looks like. Now on this boat, since it's a encapsulated keel, the bilge is gonna look different on this boat than say a, a fin keel boat, which we'll show you separately. But you look into the bilge and you can see that, well, first of all, it's dry, so that's nice. And you wanna make sure you're looking for any sort of stress cracks anywhere, and we can give you an example of that. Um, but this looks reasonably dry and clean. It needs a, maybe a little bilge cleaner, but, uh, and over here, you've got your bilge pumps. and everything looks to be in good order. You've got a lower one, and then you have an emergency backup here. Uh, but all this looks serviceable. I don't see any obvious cracks or um, oil anywhere and evidence of damage. One quick check you can do if you have access to the mast is check the standing rigging. Uh, oftentimes, if a boat is stored in a boatyard, the masts are stored in a different location. You can't always go see them. Uh, in this case, this boat is a for sale by owner and it's in someone's yard and the mast is uh, down on some sawhorses and you can quickly go over and if you're careful and you don't have gloves you can run your you can run your hand along uh, the stranded rigging which this is this is not rod rigging and feel for barbs and if you have a cloth um, like a, uh, a rag I would use that instead of your bare hand and feel for snags and if you start feeling snags um, that 
is an indication that the, the stranded wire is failing and you would want to get a rigger to take a look at it and quote you a cost to replace it. On a 38 foot boat, uh, to replace all the standing rigging, it's going to be about $5,000 to give you a, a basis uh, for figuring that out for your boat. But uh, in any event, uh, stranded rigging is easy to check. Uh, look for rust and corrosion. If you see some, then you know you're going to be in for some trouble. All right, so now we're, uh, we're looking at the keel of a Sabre 36, and you can see that this has a fine uh, seam where the two um, dissimilar materials connect. And you can't always judge a seam like this, like a book and its cover, because uh, this boat has been in the grounding, and I know that for a fact because uh, the day it was bought, it steamed into a rock doing six and a half knots, and uh, the boat has been like this for 39 years. The boat was hauled, everything was checked, and the keel bolts were tightened, and everything is fine. Versus uh, this Ericsson 32 we're going to show you up on the screen, where it had also been in the grounding. It was not disclosed, but upon uh, looking through the boat, we found some cracked framing members, uh, and that boat was going to be a massive investment to fix. So uh, don't always judge a boat. Just because it has a little seam here doesn't mean there's an issue, uh, though it could, and you want to find out by investigating as much as you can. So uh, this is another example of our sacrificial zincs not being on because it's the off season, new ones go on. Here is your uh, strut and your cutlass bearings in here. This is a folding prop. Uh, I can turn this and there's no play in it and that's what you want to check. This is solid. Uh, I happen to know that this strut was uh, replaced and rebedded recently, uh, so I know it's in good shape. All right, so now we're up on deck on that Sabre 36. So this is an example of how you might find another boat that's for sale. Uh, it's winter covered, the mast is stored on deck, and uh, other than some you know, winter detritus, this boat is in pretty clean shape. It just needs to be hosed off and, and you're good to go. But let's check, uh, let's check some last rats, Ken. Um, oh, so this is a shallow one because you got a quarter berth underneath this. Let's check the other side. But this is another thing to check for, it's just general organization and cleanliness. And you'll find this boat has it in space. Uh, so nice and clean, everything looks organized. Uh, so that's a thing to check for. All right, so while you're up on deck on a boat, you want to look around your stanchion bases here to make sure there are no stress cracks. These happen to be perfect, and we'll show you some that are not. But you can see there's no spider cracking coming out from around these. These are solid. Uh, this boat has been uh, lovingly cared for. is in good shape. So that would be a thing to look for. All right, so now we're down below on the Sabre, and this is a nice example of a beautiful sole floor that has no... Uh, issues in terms of uh, water intrusion and staining. And what's interesting about this boat is now we can see some keel bolts and um, down in your bilge. And these are obviously stainless steel and you can see them, there are several of them, and they continue on up here. But what's good to know about keel bolts is they need to be retorqued every so often. And you want to do it on the hard when there's a little weight on the keel. And you have a torque wrench and you set it for whatever the manufacturer specs are. And you crank them every now and then. And sometimes um, you'll find that they need to be tightened. And that's a good thing you have to check. And because if you don't, those bolts, uh, those uh, nuts can back themselves off and you could lose your keel. But it's rare, uh, but it is something you need to concern yourself with um, when you have a keel, yeah. uh, when you have a fin keel with keel bolts. It's so and, accessible, yeah. And it's accessible. You wanna make sure you can get to this stuff. And the other thing you wanna look for uh, on, on boats like this is you wanna look at um, your cross members and your framing here. And we're gonna show you an example of where one of these got damaged in the grounding. All right, so now we're looking at the engine on the Sabre and we've taken this apart so you can see the access to it. There's still one more piece here, but this has got probably B plus to A minus access. The transmission's access through the uh, port lazarette. Um, but here you've got your raw water strainer right here. And then you have your primary fuel filter right here and your coolant here, your oil here, and your Actually, your water pump is back here uh, behind right here. So this is a little bit funky, hard to get to, uh, but overall not bad. The alternator is currently out for the winter, uh, and this has all been decommissioned. And your secondary fuel filter uh, right here. So not bad access, and you can just see your heat exchanger back in here. So um, a little bit more access, and we have a little bit more visible from the top, which is nice. Um, so...
and uh, and angled. You notice the engine is slightly angled because the it's an offset prop. Prop. On prop. Right. Exactly. Good point. Um, so uh, not bad. And um, you know. It's nice to be able to access the top of it, but not a deal breaker, but just another example of a different type of engine setup and engine compartment. All right, uh, the last point I wanna make is uh, when you're looking at a boat, try to find some of the seacocks and open and close them. This one uh, we can't do because the engine's been winterized and the antifreeze will leak out, but uh, this is nice, nice access to your raw water intake seacock. So you wanna check them if you can see them uh, and make sure they're functioning. And lastly, while you're inside, down below on a boat, look for the chain plates and make sure there's no water staining or corrosion on them. This is an example of one that is in pretty much perfect shape. So where you can see them, look for them and, uh, and check for, like I said, corrosion and water intrusion. All right, so I created this pretend worksheet for this video. Let's pretend this is your sailboat wish list and you have a budget of $25,000. Let's be honest, a boat that you're paying $25,000 for is going to need some kind of work. And so the whole point of this exercise is to eliminate the boats that need the most work and keep the boats on your list that need the least amount of expensive work, like engines, sails, deck work, hull work. Um, you want to keep it to a minimum in terms of what you're going to need to invest after you buy the boat. So this is a very superficial top level go through of your list. Of course, you would go back a second and even a third time, maybe with a pal and take more copious notes. And then when you eliminate it down to maybe one boat, that is when you throw down the money for a full boat survey done by a professional. So this is your Boat Fools five minute DIY survey to cross boats off your list that might not be appropriate uh, because there are too many things wrong with it. No, by no means is this exhaustive or overly extensive. It's just a quick peek uh, at a boat to quickly eliminate it from your potential buy list and before you throw down uh, a couple thousand dollars for a full survey. So we hope you found that useful. Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next week. Boatful sailing in our modest vessels, waves we wrestle, thinking all the sirens sing. Ocean air sailing there, we still enjoy the finer things, we don't care. The view is pretty good for